Welcome to AATCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. Today, let us discuss about hypertensive emergencies. So, we will see what are the emergencies, how do we diagnose, how do we manage the case, that is very important. Hypertensive emergency means very high BP with an end organ damage. It can be uh, pulmonary edema, it can be cardiac failure, it can be renal failure, it can be encephalopathy, whatever it is. So, high BP with end organ damage. Severe asymptomatic hypertension or hypertensive urgency. That means BP is very high. Anytime patient can develop end organ damage, but uh, sometimes it may not be evident. So that also sometimes become hypertensive urgency. BP is around so approximately 180 millimeter uh, systolic and 110 millimeter of mercury diastolic uh, without acute target organ injury. Sometimes, remember, it may not be evident, patient may have some kidney disorder, patient can have uh, an, uh, a small cardiac failure, we may not detect all these things. So, suddenly patient will deteriorate. So, that is hypertensive urgency. Malignant hypertension means BP is very high and it comes all of a sudden and uh, all catastrophic features can be there in that type of patient. So, that is malignant hypertension. All these things, all these uh, uh, differentiating features are only for theoretical purpose, but when the patient comes to the emergency room, it's your duty to diagnose whether end organ damage is there or treat the patient, urgent treatment is required or not. All these things are clinical judgment based on your clinical judgment. So, what are the emergencies which can occur during a hypertensive urgency or emergency? Okay. So, one is encephalopathy. Most of these patients will have confusion. Headache, severe headache can be there. Irritability can be there. Some, sometimes some weakness can be there. Nephropathy means hematuria, proteinuria, progressive renal failure. But it may present with acute pulmonary edema because of renal failure. That will be the clinical finding. Intracranial hemorrhage that may be due to either due to high BP itself or due to an aneurysm with, uh, aneurysm with uh, high BP. Aortic dissection can occur sometimes, BP can be very high, lower limb pulsations can be there in uh, early phases, but once the aortic dissection ruptures, you can lose the pulse in the lower limb. So, that condition you have to be very careful. Preeclampsia, eclampsia that is related to uh, pregnancy, there also you can get high BP. Unless until you deliver the child, you cannot control the BP, that is the most important thing in eclampsia. Delivery relieves the BP. So, that is very important. Pulmonary edema, unstable angina, myocardial infarction. Most common presentation of all these things is pulmonary edema. Among all these uh, problem, it is pulmonary edema. That is the most common presentation. And other things, hemorrhage and all can occur, but sometimes it can be an hemorrhage. Then BP increases to maintain the cerebral pressure. That also can occur. Reverse also can occur. Now, what are the findings you are going to get in patients with hypertensive urgency or emergency? Any evidence of acute head injury and brain edema, that is very important, like bradycardia, altered behavior, convulsions, all these things are very important. And encephalopathy features like patient can have agitation, cuperous, uh, comatose, seizures, visual disturbances can be there in many patients. Focal neurological deficits always indicate a type of stroke, whether it is hemorrhagic or ischemic stroke. Sometimes the hemorrhage can be due to high BP. Sometimes the hemorrhage or ischemia itself will produce high BP because to maintain the cerebral perfusion pressure, we have to, the body has to increase the BP. So, both are possible. Uh, hemorrhages, exudates can be there in the fundoscopy, eye examination. Sometimes papilledema itself can be there. Nausea, vomiting can be there due to increased intracranial pressure. Chest pain, chest discomfort, lower limb BP, maybe sometimes uh, uh, lower than the upper limb BP. Suddenly the BP may collapse, lower limb pulsation will not be there in uh, uh, aortic dissection. Acute severe back pain also can be there in aortic dissection. Chest pain with back pain, severe back pain is a feature of aortic dissection. Uh, dyspnea. And uh, acute breathlessness indicates pulmonary edema due to cardiac failure. Pregnancy, think about eclampsia, that is very important. Then, uh, like cocaine, amphetamine, phenylcyclidine, monoamine, oxidase inhibitors, all these things can increase sometimes 
BP sympathetic overdose over activity can occur. The, so all these recreational type of drugs also can produce a high BP in some patients, especially in younger individuals. So what are the investigation you do when somebody is having high BP? The most important thing is ECG. That is very important because any chronic hypertension can produce LVH. That is very important. Even echo also will pick up that. Echo and uh, USG and abdomen uh, mainly rules out uh, kidney size uh, and the corticomedullary differentiation in the kidney. And renal Doppler is mainly done in renal artery stenosis. This is very important in young hypertension and hypertension starting after 50 years. Okay, both these conditions you can do a renal Doppler and you rule out uh, renal artery stenosis. Remember, clinical findings can be there in some patients. Uh, renal brewery can be there, so always auscultate. Now, fundoscopy, it will re uh, reveal uh, uh, chronic hypertensive changes in the fundus. Uh, grade 1, 2, 3, 4 uh, 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 fundus changes. Keith Wagner's classification, you should read. The last grade is papilledema. That is a sign of encephalopathy. Then if there is a uh, renal damage, creatinine and urea can be elevated. Early phase of the hypertension, uh, it can pick up proteinuria, that also can be done. Potassium is uh, low in many endocrine hypertensive like, hypertensions like Horn syndrome, Cushing syndrome. ABG also will show metabolic alkalosis in uh, Horn syndrome because of hypokalemia. Hemoglobin percentage can be very high in type 1 personality, type A personality with lot of anxiety, fear, polycythemia can be associated with uh, uh, some type of hypertension and renal uh, failure can have anemia. So, so many things you can pick up from that also. Lipid profile is also very important. A person who is having hypertension with high cholesterol that produces more damage to the arteries uh, due to uh, atherosclerosis. Thyroid test, many patients who is having high BP can have either hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism, both, in, both can increase the uh, BP, that is very important. Troponin I, C can be, that all indicates cardiac damage. So, these are the basic investigation you do in emergency room in a patient who is having hypertension. Remember, one of the easiest tool which can pick up uh, hypertensive changes, uh, ECG and ECG will pick up LVH, you can see the uh, positive waves in V, V5, V6 and negative waves in uh, V1, V2. Both you can add more than 35 small squares. Then that is very important. Here uh, 5 squares, 10 squares, uh, 15, uh, 20, 23, or uh, add another 3, okay. Uh, 35 it comes, okay. More than 35 indicates uh, an LVH by voltage criteria. You can do an echo and find out whether the patient is having actual LVH or not. So, ECG is a very important tool in emergency room to see whether this patient is having an uncontrolled and long-standing hypertension or not. That is very important. Like example for patients who is having recent onset of hypertension, or only today patient is having hypertension like uh, he has taken amphetamine or cocaine or he is having fear from acetoma, episodic hypertension, this ECG change may not be there. So, ECG will pick up long standing hypertension with LVH. That is a very important finding in hypertensive management. Fundus change is also very important. You can see whether cotton wool appearances, copper wiring appearances, silver wiring appearances, papilledema, all these things are very important. You can grade the hypertension only by uh, great hypertensive retinopathy by seeing the optical fundus that is also very important in emergency room. Now, how to reduce the BP that is very important. So, previously uh, many doctors used to give sublingual nifedipine. The sublingual nifedipine capsule used to be given many patients, but we should never give that because of drastic reduction in the BP can produce damage to the internal circulation, especially kidney and brain. So, suddenly if you are reducing the BP, the perfusion to kidney and brain that they all set for that high BP for a long time, suddenly that can reduce and damage the kidney and brain. So, never try to reduce it uh, uh, very fastly, you take your own time and uh, there are some guidelines for that, we will see. For most hypertensive emergencies, mean arterial pressure, uh, pressure should be reduced 
very slowly around 10 to 20 percent in the first hour and by further 5 to 15 hour next 23 hours. So, you need to reduce at least 35 to 40 percent of the existing BP by 24 hours that is more than enough. Suppose it is 200 systolic, 200 millimeter of mercury systolic by next day you have to reduce only 40 percent of that systolic that means uh, it may be around uh, uh, like uh, 160 or 140 uh, into that range 200 to 140 you can reduce over 24 hours. So, around 40 percent of the existing BP can be reduced over 24 hours. In first hour you need to reduce only 10 to 20 percent that is all. You need to drastically reduce the BP. This uh, the target BP may be around 180 by 120 in the first hour and 160, 110 in the next uh, 23 hours. That means over a period of uh, 24 hours, uh, it can be around 130, uh, 80 to 100. That's all. More, more, not more than that. A sudden reduction can produce damage to the internal circulation. This is called as J curve phenomenon or J curve response. Aggressive reduction of BP can produce sudden dip in the uh, BP and sudden dip in the internal circulation. That is because suppose somebody is having a high BP for a long time, maybe 2 years, 3 years, his BP is very high, we do not know. We suddenly reduce the BP by sublingual uh, uh, nifidipin or NPG drastically reduce the BP. All your internal organs are set for that high BP for a good perfusion. Suddenly, if you are reducing the BP of that person to uh, 120 by 80, then there will be acute reduction in the internal circulation that can damage actually the, your kidneys or heart or brain. Most important damage can occur in the brain and the heart that is very important. Now, this is Jacker response. Uh, what is Jacker response that is very important? It can increase the cardiac mortality. When an elevated BP is lowered, the cardiovascular events uh, is uh, de uh, decreasing, but lower BP uh, below a critical point uh, is no longer beneficial and possibly even uh, dangerous to that patient. You can see that J curve up to this uh, sudden up to this it may be okay, the reduction may be okay, but suddenly mortality you can see mortality especially uh, heart, kidney, brain can increase. So, that is called as J curve response, but basically suddenly you are reducing the internal circulation of all organs from a high BP. So, that produces uh, some adverse effects in that patient. So, we do not want to reduce the BP drastically that is what uh, we want to discuss. Now, stroke with high BP that is also another area where we whether we can reduce the BP drastically or not. We know that uh, uh, in a patient who is having high BP they can have hemorrhagic stroke like sometimes patient can have an aneurysm and aneurysm and they can have uh, uh, high BP because of uh, that high BP patient develops hemorrhagic stroke. But whereas in an ischemic stroke this is called as ischemic penumbra phenomenon. So, uh, one area is damaged the brain is not getting adequate blood to that area blood supply is reduced. So, what happens the collaterals collaterals means different arteries it may be a different artery. So, the collateral may, may be supplying that area that is called as core area. So, these collaterals are supplied by another artery. So, this artery is not uh, perfusing properly. So, body will try to increase the systolic systemic BP so that the collaterals will be perfusing your brain properly. The core area is not uh, getting blood because of uh, this artery is blocked, but the surrounding area that is getting blood because of the collaterals. So, this is called as ischemic penumbra. But suppose you reduce the BP drastically because you, you are thinking that 180 uh, by 100 is a bad BP in a stroke patient, you are suddenly reducing the BP. Here also BP will reduce, all this uh, blood vessels BP will reduce and the perfusion to this area also will be cut off, okay. So, that even can kill this area also. So, this ischemic penumbra also can be sometimes damaged. So, we should never try to reduce BP drastically especially in ischemic stroke whereas in hemorrhagic stroke you can reduce the BP better than uh, that uh, other one that is ischemic stroke but even then you should not reduce the BP that is also because of the same effect there is a hemorrhage here 
So this uh, surrounding area is not perfusing well because of the pressure effect of this area. So to perfuse that area, sometimes we need some minimum BP. Okay. If you reduce that also thinking that the hemorrhage can extend, so this area also will die. So that is a tricky area here. So you have to be very careful when you are reducing the BP in hemorrhage and ischemia, especially in ischemic brain injury. Now, posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome, that is a syndrome occurs mainly, it is a radiological syndrome, but patient can have some posterior circulation features, like some patients can have sometimes uh, uh, like visual defects also during this period. So that is due to a vasogenic edema occurring in the posterior circulation, sometimes it can produce uh, uh, like headache, seizures, altered mental status and visual loss. So, any patient is having high BP and visual loss, you have to always think about press, press syndrome, okay. So, there also you have to reduce BP, uh, uh, little, little quicker than the previous one, the normal ischemic stroke. So, hypertensive encephalopathy around uh, 10 to 20 percent during the first hour of treatment, uh, that is also same as previously we discussed. Uh, then, uh, suppose, uh, uh, after that, you can uh, reduce it uh, more than 25 percent or, or near 40 percent, you can reduce over 24 hours. Some patients can have severe autonomic dysfunction. That patient, we should not actually reduce the BP with routine drugs. Some patients with guillain barry syndrome or multiple system atrophy, they can have high BP and tachycardia sometimes and low BP on bradycardia. So, the same patient can have both these uh, symptoms uh, during their hospital stay. So, we have to be very careful. Their labetalol will be a better choice than any other antihypertensive. Suppose a guillain barry syndrome patient is coming, his BP is suddenly shooting up, he is having tachycardia, ECG shows some SCP changes, then after some time it is going to bradycardia or uh, hypertension. That uh, indicates an autonomic dysfunction. Better drug in that case will be labetalol. In almost all other conditions also, labetalol is a, uh, one of the best drugs which, which can be used in emergency room nowadays. Pheochromocytoma is one condition where we should not use beta blocker as a first line drug. But there also you can control the BP uh, whenever there is an emergency or crisis, you can control the BP. Both tachycardia and uh, high BP should be controlled with uh, sodium nitroprusside, uh, phenylamine, or nicotrophene. Uh, but the problem is uh, 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 if you are using beta blocker, that can produce unopposed alpha action and BP or heart rate can increase. We have to be very careful. That we will discuss afterwards. Now, there are some exceptions uh, uh, like uh, uh, patients who is having uh, gradual reduction on the first day. Acute phase of an ischemic stroke, you can uh, reduce the BP little more if there is no large ischemia. Acute aortic dissection, there you have to reduce the BP very drastically. Intracranial hemorrhage also you have to reduce very drast drastically. Another important condition is pulmonary edema. There also you can you have to reduce the BP drastically. Now, aortic dissection is one condition where if you do not reduce the BP, patient can collapse immediately. So, you have to reduce the BP to 100 to 120 uh, in uh, uh, like uh, systolic BP in within 20 minutes. That is very important. There you, we use uh, sodium nitroprusate that will be a better drug. Another important condition is uh, head trauma. There actually BP is not there, BP uh, to maintain the cerebral perfusion pressure, we need little higher BP, but uh, even then very high BP should be reduced, otherwise bleeding can increase. So, head trauma also we should try to reduce fast. Now, what are the drugs commonly we use? One of the important drug is uh, sodium nitroprusate. It can be started with 0.3 microgram per kg per minute, usual dose is 2 to 5 microgram per kg per minute. Uh, uh, you have to cover the uh, uh, drug bottle, uh, uh, otherwise it can produce severe cyanide toxicity. So, you have to be very careful. NTG is another safer drug, it is an alternative for this drug. Uh, it is a safer drug, NTG. So, NTG can be started with 5 microgram per kg per minute, that can be started and BP can be uh, reduced. One of the important side effects of uh, this drug is headache. So, that is a common side effect of nitroglycerin. So, uh, if you see anti, uh, sodium nitroprusate, this is as good as or better than 
uh, NTG, but it has got some contraindication. Pregnant woman, you cannot give. Uh, a patient with uh, uh, renal failure also, you cannot give this drug. We have to be very careful. Now, Lepetrolol is the most useful drug in emergency room, uh, except conditions like pheochromocytoma. There, it is better to use for another drug. It's also we know that it's already having an alpha and beta activity, but it has got a more beta blocking activity than alpha blocking activity. Lepetrolol can be used in safely in most of the conditions, uh, but remember uh, patients who is having severe bronchospasm, history of asthma bradycardia, heart blocks, severe cardiac failure, better to avoid this drug. Even pheochromocytoma also it may be, when, uh, may be uh, effective because it has got some alpha activity also, but uh, uh, it, the beta activity is more than alpha activity. So, Lepetrolol is the best drug among all the drugs uh, which is available for uh, emergency room. I have given uh, a chart which will tell you where all these drugs are useful. So, if you see the uh, Lepetrolol, that will come most of the areas, almost all conditions you can use Lepetrolol. Aortic dissection, Lepetrolol can be used. Pulmonary edema, it can be used. But pulmonary edema, only one condition. Uh, if there is a severe cardiac failure, better to avoid Lepetrolol as a first line drug. Acute myocardial uh, infarction, Metaprolol is the uh, indicated drug, but Lepetrolol also can be used. Renal failure, Lepetrolol can be given. Pregnancy, eclampsia, Lepetrolol can be given. Hypertensive encephalopathy, Lepetrolol can be given. Intracranial hemorrhage, Lepetrolol is an ideal drug. Stroke, it is an ideal drug. Post-operative procedure, there also it can be. So, almost all conditions where hypertension is there, you can use Lepetrolol as a safer drug because it has, it's a beta blocker, it has got additional alpha activity also. But remember, cardiac failure, we have to be very careful. Now, we have discussed about how to manage hypertensive emergency, urgency in your emergency room. Remember one thing, sometimes the, the BP is only because of pain, because after road traffic accident, severe pain or after surgery, after sedation, patient has severe pain. That pain itself can increase the BP. There you should not give any antihypertensive, there you should give pain relieving medicines, then only the BP can be controlled. Conditions like pregnancy with eclampsia, BP control is not the main treatment there. You have to take the patient for uh, like a, a safe delivery. Once the delivery occurs, you can see that BP is coming down. Till then, only a bridging therapy can be done with your beta blocker. So, that is also very important. Pheochromocytoma is, uh, uh, is one of the major problem uh, because uh, it's not very common, but it's a major problem in emergency room. Patient can have hypertension, tachycardia, cardiac failure, uh, pulmonary edema, all these things. Usage of beta blockers are not safe in this type of patients. So, alpha blockage has to be given either along with or before the, uh, before starting beta blocker. NTG is one of the easiest thing you can give in all types of uh, hypertensive emergencies because it has got no much side effect but it can produce sometimes severe headache, that's all. There is no major side effect, some patients can have hypertension. So, in a patient coming with acute pulmonary edema, after giving Lasix, then starting NIV ventilation, then if you give NTG, it will be very useful. There, you cannot use beta blocker because uh, sometimes patient may have cardiac failure, beta blocker can aggravate this problem. So, we have to be very careful. So, we have learned about uh, acute hypertensive emergency and its management. Thank you.